Okay, it's like uh, everybody is here, I think. All right, so we'll revive our motivation using foundation of all good qualities. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding how the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once is greatly meaningful and it's difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities, and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pratamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. I have become firmly convinced of this. Please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajradhara. Okay, so before we start with content, um, I thought to tell you guys about a new plan that I have for you, because it's, um, it's my last semester with you guys, and, um, and then SK will bring you all the way home. Um, I thought it would be useful, and what I really want to know is what of the Dharma is connecting with you and what isn't, and what kind of hanging doubts you might have. So what I'm going to start doing is at the last 15 minutes of every class, I'm going to make a breakout room and talk to three of you at a time. And then um, for the rest of you, I'm making a 15 minute meditation pre-recorded. So you guys will have a 15 minute meditation at the end of each class for the rest of the semester. And um, during that time, I'll be pulling out people to talk to. So that'll start next week. And um, I'll send you an email. We're going to go back over what we did last week, which was the meditation session, which was some things you already knew and some things maybe um, that were a bit new. And today we're going to go through it more experientially. So I'm going to do um, some slides on the screen, but if you'd prefer to just really close your eyes and listen, that's completely fine too. It'll be somewhere between a reflection and an analytical meditation. So I'm just gonna kind of walk you through what we would do in those six preparatory practices, including the seven limb prayer, which is kind of a way to get your mind conducive to meditation. And after we walk ourselves through it, um, then we'll talk about what works and what doesn't for you guys and any questions you might have. Um, the practice that I'm going to be basing this on is the White Tara practice. And the reason I'm choosing White Tara is because I think we all could use a health and long life boost. And also because we haven't done very much with White Tara before. So it just kind of gives you another deity to put into your tool belt in case you're curious. So um, we're going to start doing that. So if you want to get yourself kind of a meditation posture, nice straight back. Um, if you want to be close to the screen to see what I'm putting up there, you can be. But if you'd prefer to just visualize, I'll describe what's on the screen as well. So the six preparatory practices are to make the mind conducive to meditation and receptive to blessings. So just think about the space that you're in right now. And because we can't get up and clean this second, just kind of mentally put some things away. If there's some pens out, if there's some notebooks out, just kind of mentally 
put some things away and just kind of psychologically clean the space by thinking about where different things might go. And then think about any representations of your path that you might have physically somewhere in the house. <clears throat> Maybe it's a picture of a teacher or a picture of a Buddha or a relative you look up to. And then imagine some physical offerings on your altar space, even if it's just a countertop or a window ledge where you have a meaningful photo. You could imagine some flowers from your garden or some beautiful fruit from your kitchen, clean, clear water, but just visualize some offerings. And then really arrange your seat in terms of your posture. And for this brief time, try and make sure that your back is straight up and down. And then we set a preliminary motivation. You can think, in order to attain the fully accomplished state of a Buddha, for the sake of all living beings, I will enter into the sadhana or practice method of White Tara, the wish-fulfilling wheel. In order to attain the fully accomplished state of a Buddha, for, all, for the sake of all living beings, I will enter into the sadhana of White Tara, the wish-fulfilling wheel. In order to attain the fully accomplished state of a Buddha, for the sake of all living beings, I will enter into the sadhana of White Tara, the wish-fulfilling wheel. And you can reframe that motivation into your own words, but do what you can to make it connect with your heart. And then refuge. You can imagine that you and all mother sentient beings are taking refuge together, that you're the leader servant of all living beings. And the prayer goes, I and all living beings as extensive as space from Tente on until the essence of enlightenment is achieved, take refuge in the glorious holy guru Take refuge in the fully accomplished Buddhas. Take refuge in the Holy Dharma. Take refuge in the Supreme Assembly. I take refuge in the Venerable Lady White Tara, the wish-fulfilling wheel, and the complete entourage of deities. I and all living beings as extensive as space 
from today on until the essence of enlightenment is achieved. Take refuge in the glorious holy gurus. Take refuge in the fully accomplished Buddhas. Take refuge in the holy Dharma. Take refuge in the supreme assembly. I take refuge in the venerable lady White Tara, the wish fulfilling wheel and the complete entourage of deities. I and all living beings as extensive as space from today on until the essence of enlightenment is achieved. Take refuge in the glorious holy gurus. Take refuge in the fully accomplished Buddhas. Take refuge in the holy Dharma. Take refuge in the supreme assembly. I take refuge in the venerable lady White Tara, the wish fulfilling wheel and the complete entourage of deities. I prostrate and take refuge in the holy guru and the three precious jewels. Please bestow your blessings on my mind stream. Connecting with refuge. And then we visualize and invoke our objects of refuge. Imagine combining it with that prayer. There's the merit field, which we can simplify with Buddha Shakyamuni, Maitreya of the method lineage, Manjushri of the wisdom lineage, combined into Lama Tsongkhapa with our root guru in front of him. which can even further be simplified into just our root guru, maybe Lama Tsongkhapa at his heart. And then we visualize white Tara, one face, two arms, radiant white made of transparent light, the essence of health and long life she has an eye on the palms of her hands, an eye at the soles of her feet, and a third eye between her two eyes of the main face. And we imagine that the guru, pictured here as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and White Tara, the deity that we're going to be practicing, become one. And so we recite the mantra Za Hum Bam Ho, thinking that the deity comes above our head, dissolves into us, our mind mixes with the mind of the deity, and we're happy. Za Hum Bam Ho. And so feel that the Buddhas that you visualized and the actual Buddhas are one and present. And then we offer them the seven limbs. And starting with prostration, gods and asuras with their crowns bow down to your lotus feet. I prostrate to Mother Tara, the one who rescues from all needs. And so thinking Tara, one in nature with all teachers, all mentorship energy, all idealized self objects, takes this archetypal form of the feminine divine. And we mentally prostrate, becoming receptive. And then the offerings that we've set out, either mentally or physically, we actually give. Not because the Buddhas need it, but because we need merit. And what we offer to, we connect significance to and become receptive to. 
So we'll offer water for washing, water for drinking, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music, which all represent the qualities we want to develop. And the prayer goes, Om Guru Aryatare Sapariware Agyam Padyam Pupe Dupe Haloke Gende Nure Shabda Pradisahum Soha We think that the Buddhas happily receive these offerings. And we confess negativities, recognizing faults to be faults, very briefly, maybe just things that have happened today. Is there anything physically, verbally, or mentally that was not in alignment with your motivation and your path? Just very gently scan through earlier today. with an honest mind, free from guilt. You can use the 10 non-virtues as your template to check. So physically, was there any acts of killing, stealing or sexual misconduct? Verbally, were there acts of lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, or gossip? Mentally, did you give in to covetousness, attachment, ill will, anger, wrong views, afflicted doubt? and think these mistakes are not me. These mistakes are adventitious, they're removable. But the only way they're removable is if I recognize them and purify them. So I lay my mind bare to my own self under the gaze of the enlightened mind in the form of white Tara. And then you shift to rejoicing and think just even today, physically, verbally, and mentally, what has been in alignment with your path that has been positive and beneficial, things you want to continue doing. Start with yourself just today.
And then you request the teacher in the form of White Tara to please remain until the end of cyclic existence. And please teach until the end of cyclic existence creating the cause for all of your teachers to remain in your life, creating the cause to meet them in every life, in particular their teachings. So imagine that white Tara embodies and represents all of your teachers as you make these two requests internally to yourself towards them. and they happily accept your request. And you dedicate through the merit collected by this practice, may we attain the state of Venerable Tara and lead all living beings without exception to her state of enlightenment. When the signs of untimely death appear by instantly seeing the form of the wish fulfilling wheel the power of the Lord of Death is eliminated. May I swiftly attain the state of a knowledge holder of immortality. And think that the Guru Deity now melts into light and dissolves into us. and blesses our body, speech, and mind with inspiration to practice. And you can relax your attention. So that can be a preliminary to then doing shamatha. Or in the middle of that, you could insert mantra practice or analytical meditation on compassion or any number of things. But <clears throat> it can seem like quite an elaborate thing until you're used to it. And then it's just, you know, I don't know, it's your old um, touchstones, you know, prostrate, offer, confess, rejoice, request, request, dedicate. You know, it just becomes something that gets your mind oriented to the fact that it's a big deal that you're training your mind rather than just letting it do what it's always done. And it kind of, um, it's like a form of dignity and self-respect um, to really make some sacredness around your practice but you don't wanna make it so tight that you then like freak yourself out and make it too big a deal and get overwhelmed and don't do it at all. you know. So just do what parts make sense for you. But it can, I guess it can give you some more really dignity is the word, like what you're doing is significant. Don't make it a big deal. Don't take yourself too seriously, but it's important, it's significant. And there is backup and there is support for you besides the human beings in your life or maybe accessed through the human beings in your life, but you're never alone and what you're doing is important. Do you have some, some thoughts about that process or um, parts that didn't make sense that you wanted to ask about? I don't know how to make it my own. I mean, how to find the right Tara <laughs> and also Either I, I'm feeling that I'm not doing it right because I'm not, I can't manage to follow the exact steps. And how, how, and I, I'm trying to find a way to make it my own. Because I, I came to a conclusion that at least for now I can't do it in, in the original ritual way, although I want to follow some. Um, 
some steps regularly because otherwise it will not happen. So I need to make it my own steps that I can follow and, uh, and go through it. And I, personally, I feel like I have the, um, when we sit down together for meditation, I have the vibe, I have the atmosphere but I, but I can't follow, um, follow it from A to Z, like, like orderly. And mm. I have the sitting, I have the physical uh, mindfulness, I have um, the um, intention or the motivation. These steps I already have, but other than that, I get, and, and the breathing, of course, but but that's it. That's where I got so far. And I'm not sure how to make it my own steps mm. further along the way. With the prostration, with the... I think the part of the guru is, is not sitting right with me. Uh, mm. And... Um, and and then and then I get uh, I don't know how to um, kind of uh, I don't know um, kapdanit or um, uh, strict. Either mm -hmm. I do it uh, as it as I as it should be, or I don't do it at all. How do I? And and I'm trying to find some kind of a middle way mm. of my own through it. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, this the the new piece that I introduced today that that we haven't really talked about before. Maybe some of you that have tantric practice have seen it, but this idea of za hum bam ho, which is the deity comes to our head, dissolves into us, we become inseparable, and we're happy about it. And the idea here, you know, you could do nothing except this, the idea that your teachers and your idealized, you know, whatever, self object or goal or, you know, potential fully realized are one in the same, you invited them and now they've merged with you. So this is our practice of merging in Tantra. This is what we do to merge. And, you know, the mantra is za hum bam ho, but basically it just means you invited the deity, they dissolve into us, we become inseparable and it's joyful. And that premise doesn't have to be too structured. You know, it doesn't have to be tight or strict, but it's an idea that you're personifying your goal you know, whether it's a representation of a human being you've actually met, or if it's an archetypal quality that, you know, is evoked by these deity images, or it's just light. The idea that there's something outside of yourself that you bring to the forefront of your mind and then merge with. It can be very supportive. It's not necessary. Not everybody needs to do it. It might not be everyone's cup of tea. Um, but I think that's the new element to kind of bring in once you've done your motivation, because you guys know your posture, you know your motivation. Now, how do you bring in some support that is not just touching refuge, but somehow embodied refuge and merging with refuge? And that piece, I think, could really add a lot to whatever comes next, even if what is next is a simple shine meditation or, you know, a quote, simple patience meditation, it sort of like launches you in a way that holds you through the whole process. But um, it might not work for everyone, but this zahum bam ho, basically, may I merge with my potential that's actualized in this external form, somehow wakes up your own confidence that progress is possible. So I'm showing you the more kind of traditional layout and traditional prayers, but understand there's always a psychology underneath them that is a lot more flexible than the structure might indicate. Um, 
with the students in the Blue Mountains, I used to have them write their own seven limb prayer as an ex exercise. So they just had the headings of each of the seven limbs and then they composed their own poetry to go under each one so that it worked for them. Um, but yeah, how, how else did it go for folks? Was it totally unrelatable or were there parts that you could touch? For me, um, it's, it's an inspiration and uh, and uh, it's, it's more than feeling it's um it's it's a kind of um, uh, um kind of knowing that that uh, it holds uh, something this this uh, merging that you talk about in in our language let's say um what what uh, i can uh, share is um is this Wondering whether uh, when I um, when I connect to the motivation, in a way, I'm almost there. And in a way, my problem is that that that, that the difficult part is to wish. Not 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 as a text, but but from from deep inside. And, and when I'm not connected to the wish, then then I'm. This is kind of something that I'm occupied with. You mean like um, the aspiration to practice at all? Exactly. Yeah. No, not, not at all, but, but to, to be uh, connected to the whole um, frame of reference, to the whole, to, of merging. In, mm -hmm. in this way. Yeah. I, I... Remember that merging is possible in the deepest sense. Yeah. So yeah, to wish for something that 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 is not an idea, but but a kind of knowing or experience of possibility, and it's when it's there, then it's really easy to wish for it. But yeah, how much more improved our quality of life will be if we elevate our practice? sometimes it's hard to feel motivated to do anything more than what we're doing because already what we're doing is nice and what we're doing is useful and we're relatively ethical, rel relatively kind, relatively effective people in this world. And so then we take that for granted, like uh, that's all we can do with this life. And it's it can almost be a form of like that laziness of despondency that we talked about a few years ago where it's like a heaviness and a, a false modesty, a false humility that says more than what I'm doing is for better people than me or more powerful people than me or smarter people or more advanced people. And you're sort of putting yourself down as an excuse not to progress, <laughs> you know? And um, it's disempowering in a way. Um, so that, that can happen there's that piece but then there's just sometimes the piece of is there anything to merge with it all just i don't know let's see and you try and look through your life for moments of transcendence you know you look th through your life for moments of awe and deep connection and you know maybe it was related to another person maybe it was related to nature maybe it was some poem or song but there are moments of transcendence and awe in our lives divorced from anything religious or so-called spiritual, which can help us feel like there is something to merge with, but how to make it happen in an organized, regular way without any expectations or pressure to connect even when you don't feel connection, to create some sort of habit of connecting. And then some days it really happens and some days it doesn't, but you have such a habit of connecting that it does become more frequent. And that's why we have these structures to kind of hold us. It's, it's very much like a diet, right? Like there's a million different diets that will make you healthy and give you energy. But knowing that doesn't mean you're any healthier. You actually have to do it, <laughs> you know? And some days you feel really healthy because of your new diet and so much new energy. And some days you feel the same as you always did when you ate crap food all day. So you think, oh, is this diet even working? 
I feel the same as I always did. But you know, you know that it's the consistency and the structure of it that holds you in health. And as time goes by, the foundations of your health become stronger. You know, however diets work, I don't know, like I diet, right? I just ate cinnamon rolls for breakfast, but you know what I mean, right? Like the seven limb prayer and the six preparatory practices are like your spiritual container or your spiritual diet to kind of give you a foundation of health so that whenever health is possible, it's immediately there for you. But it doesn't have to be so strict, you know, it's just you have to pick something. <laughs> just knowing that many, many things work and many things touch that type of wisdom doesn't mean you're touching that type of wisdom. And that's the danger for us who are, you know, regular, you know, relatively smart people is we understand how something might work were we to do it. And then it's as if we've already done it and then are disappointed that it's not working. But we've actually never tried. <laughs> we've just kind of looked at how it might work if we tried. So to give yourself to a process is an act of both confidence and humility, right? You have enough confidence to realize you'll be able to figure it out if it's working for you or not. You know, you, you're, you're confident in your own ability to recognize wisdom, progress, and connection. But you're humble enough to realize that perhaps there are people who have done this better than you <laughs> in a more organized, efficient way than you, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Thank goodness. So let's enter into a process 100% and we might let it go someday. Maybe we'll do something else, but we'll never know if it works if we don't give ourselves to it completely. You're not outing yourself, right? You're, it's secret, it's private. This is something you're doing internally. And maybe you have the white Tara practice and you scan through it and you see one line that you love, just one line, but that's enough to start to carry you. Sometimes we feel like we're supposed to declare something like now I am a Buddhist, or now I am an analyst, you know, I am a coach, you know, this type or this type, you know, and it's like, you can have that be actually very private and sacred and holding you. Do you know what I'm trying to say, right? Like, like, sometimes I feel like you guys don't feel like you can say that you're committed, if you're not saying that you're a Buddhist, and you don't have to say you're a Buddhist to be committed to a process. But there is a level of commitment that has to happen internally and privately for anything to work. It can't live in the realm of theory. So what do you merge with is a deep, very deep conversation. But it's just with yourself. You know, and here, but you know, it's, it's with yourself. Have I lost you or, or do you know what I mean? Like, what is it to give yourself to a process? Ranan, you're unmuted. You want to say something? No? Just to echo it, to second it with all my heart. You know, I, I realize that you guys having so many ordained teachers might make you think that that's what commitment looks like. You know, but remember Andy and Sean, right? Like they were hardcore Buddhists, but just like normal people married with kids living their life, but they're like totally in their practice. You know, it just looks this way for, you know, myself and SK and Venerable Amy, cause that's what works for us, but you don't have to be so full on about it. <laughs> you know, you can just wear jeans and be normal. Stealth Bodhisattvas. So, when you're thinking about your own meditation session, I guess training ourselves not to be embarrassed to go back to the beginning, even if we've been doing this a long time, because it'll be a deeper beginning and a deeper beginning and a deeper beginning. You know, don't feel like you should be somewhere by now. You know, this is all just kind of needing to find a place to live in your brain and then digest and then come into your daily life. 
but I guess the, the point that I want to make here is that structure and regularity very gently will help. <laughs> and if you're wondering why your practice isn't going as quickly as you would want it to, probably it's something about consistency and discipline and maybe a lack of gentleness with it. You know, maybe you're very disciplined, maybe you're very strict and it's not going anywhere, but maybe the gentleness and the warmth is missing. Or maybe you're gentle and warm, but no structure whatsoever. So just, you know, just very, very gently start again and start again. Every day start again. So um, in terms of the Lam Rim, you know, we talked about the source of the Lam Rim teachings and the three scopes and a bit about guru devotion and the meditation session. And then we brought it all together. Those sections, is there any more that you want to talk about before we move on next week to perfect human rebirth? Um, the guru conversation's important. Understanding the history and the structure of the Lam Rim is important understanding how to have a meditation session personally is important. So I don't want to move it on um, unless you guys are ready. If you want to find a guru, what are you looking for? <laughs> you don't have to say if you are or you aren't, but if you want to, what are you looking for? Give me three important characteristics and then I'll let it go. Omniscient. Oh, omniscient. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you might as well, right? But how can you check? <laughs> how can you check? Um, in the chat, it says walk the talk. Yes, exactly. Yeah, consistency. They practice what they preach for sure. Um, what's what's a very boring but very important main characteristic? Boring but essential. Ethical conduct. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Why call, yeah. it, why call it boring? Because people get bored talking about ethics. It's tricky because so many of our teachers and our leaders and our mentors and the artists that we look up to have terrible ethics, right? Like so many, so many great artists. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I loved Picasso. I just loved Picasso, everything about Picasso. My room was full of Picasso and the Dalai Lama. And then I found out that he was a horrible womanizer and such a misogynist. And I was so heartbroken, you know? So the thing is for, for our gurus is that that heartbroken feeling that we have when people we look up to turn out to be inconsistent or unethical, that heartbreak when you come across it with uh, an artist that you love or a partner or, I don't know, a family member who betrays you, that's devastating. But when it's with the guru, it's like shattering. So often people look for charisma and fun in their teachers first. Do they light me up? Do they get me excited? Before looking at, do they seem ethical? You know? And in terms of a long-term relationship with a teacher, it's, it's like inspiration is really, really important. But before you commit, check the ethics. If they've got crappy ethics, you can still go to their teachings and enjoy and enjoy the fact that they're knowledgeable and fun to listen to, but you're not gonna put your trust in them, right? It's a whole different thing. So ethics are so important, are so important. And it's hard to check ethics, but it's much easier to check ethics than to check for omniscience, because you can't actually ever know if someone is omniscient until you're omniscient. But you can check their ethics. Are they consistent? Are there weird rumors? Follow up on the weird rumors. See if they hold water. You know, ask them directly. <laughs> see how they respond. You know, like do that. And then, you know, of course, um, it's the degenerate age. It's hard to find people who are perfect with their ethics, but if it's at least an, an amount of consistency that you feel safe with, you know what I mean? So that's the key one, ethics and uh, <clears throat> a markedly significant study more than your own and some sort of, some sort of qualities that seem like they're more than your qualities. Don't be afraid to um, 
ask people um, if you've heard weird rumors or something and you're worried could be not true, but you know, just ask them. There's a great story of, um, I think it was, Oh, it was some Tibetan Lama, I can't remember who. And there was kind of a mentally ill woman who had a baby and she said, this is your baby, this is your baby, take back your baby. And the Lama knew it wasn't his, he knew his vows were unbroken and perfect, but he saw that she was in distress. And so he just took the baby and patted the baby and just kept teaching, you know, until she settled down, you know? So if they're reacting like really defensively, you know, there's something to investigate, but um, anyway blah, blah, blah. You know how to recognize stuff in people. But in terms of merging with something other than a human being, merging with an ideal maybe is safer. So define it though. How do you merge with compassion? You have to know it viscerally. And you already do know it viscerally, but like bring it up to your mind. Like what is it to give it? What is it to receive it? Both directions how different the world is with it, how horrible the world is without it, as an individual, as a society, you know, all the way around analysis, 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 and then let go of analysis and be in it. You know, so you need analysis to get you there, but then you can free yourself of analysis once you've touched it. So merging with an ideal maybe is something more accessible if the idea of merging with the guru as a person, as a personified archetype, as a whatever, if all of that is just too complicated or too unsafe or whatever doesn't sit with you, still the idea of merging with a concept I think is really key. So guru yoga in tantra very much is merging with an ideal and it just happens to be accessed through a person. Anyway, any, any follow-up about guru devotion before we go on? Okay, and anything about the meditation session? Can you tell me if you're not speaking up because of a specific reason I should know about? <laughs> and we just agree with you on. <laughs> okay. I'm not kidding. Okay. No. You're, you can disagree, <laughs> you know, we can fight in a friendly way. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is no need to. <laughs> we just agree. Okay. So um, the word of the day is Zahum Bam Ho. Okay. That's the word of the day. This is merging outside with inside. And um, I, I think it's a cool premise. I think there's a way to make it secular. I think there's a way to make it accessible to you. But um, this concept um, is a really lovely concept. So um, here it is once again. And um, you know, when you're doing a visualization with a guru, if it's a person, you can always visualize Lama Tsongkhapa at their heart. And of course, very tiny is Buddha Shakyamuni at his heart. And even tinier than that is Vajadara at his heart. But you're just thinking many into one, it can just be light. But um, what it represents is the main thing. All right, so, um, so next week we'll start with perfect human rebirth and meditation at the end of class and one-on-one -on -one, or um, three-on-one, I guess, <laughs> conversations with you guys about how the, how the program's been going for you and stuff. So. Um, we'll just take a minute and dedicate. Janchu sam jorim po she ma ke panam ke yuchi ke pan yam pa me pa yi gon e gon du pao May the precious supreme bodhicitta not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. Bodan Rajin do sem me padang, Budre tendrel lua me pani, Pensuan gel me drosu jalai, Ludra gondon dompa jingilu. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of inherent existence, and cause and effect and dependent arising are unbetraying. I seek your blessings to discern the meaning of Nagarjuna's thought that these two are mutually complementary and not contradictory. 
And so just sitting with that. Okay, see you um, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you.